Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Neil Van Loyen. He is Associate Professor of Philosophy and Associate Faculty of the Neuroscience Institute at Georgia State University. And today we're talking about his new book, uh, Religion as Make-Believe, A Theory of Belief, Imagination and Group Identity. So, Neil, welcome to the show. It's a huge pleasure to have you on. All right. Well, thank you, Ricardo. So, I would like to start with perhaps uh, a basic question here. So, what is belief exactly, or how do you approach belief in your work? Well, belief as a general category is, is really of great interest to philosophers, but not just philosophers, psychologists, and then uh, society at large. So, so, belief is broadly speaking, and the point of my book is that there are very different kinds of beliefs, but broadly speaking, it's a psychological state that represents how things are or might be in the world and that guides actions, guides how you might behave, right? So a simple example, I believe in some sense that the switch is connected to the light and because I want to turn on the light, I flip the switch. The belief is false, the light doesn't come on, the garbage disposal turns on instead or something like that. But there are other kinds of beliefs as well, beliefs that tend to constitute our group identities, right? So one might say, Neil believes in the Trinity, right? Or Ricardo believes that uh, the proletariat will rise, right? And that one might constitute you as a Marxist and me as a Christian and so on. And these are also representational psychological states that portray how things are or might be right? There's a, a trinity, the proletariat will rise. But the thesis of the book is that despite the common name belief, as it's used by philosophers and psychologists, our way of relating to those kind of ideas are very different from the ways that we relate to ordinary factual ideas in the typical case. They're different ways of thinking or processing. And that's really the aim of the book is to tease apart what I call religious credence and factual belief. And so what are the differences there between religious credence and factual belief? Well, the differences come down to how one might relate to an idea or how one might process an idea. Now, note, I'm not focusing on contents, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not focusing on what the ideas are about. For any given idea, you can relate to it in the religious credence kind of way. Yeah. or in the factual belief kind of way. But what are those different ways of relating? Well, there are four differences that I think are really important. One, when you factually believe an idea, you can't really help it, right? If you, if you flip a switch and the garbage disposal comes on, then you are going to end up factually believing that the switch is connected to the garbage disposal instead of the light. So generally speaking, factual beliefs are involuntary. They're constrained by the evidence that hits you in the face, but you can't really, can't really do anything about it, right? If you factually mm -hmm. believe it, you can't help believing it. By way of contrast, a lot of anthropology of religion and psychology of religion suggests, and also just personal experience suggests, that religious credences are voluntary, right? People choose to have them. People talk about choosing Jesus. And there's lots of historical examples that suggest that people converted by choice, perhaps under pressure, but it's not as if they were constrained by evidence in the factual belief kind of way. So voluntary versus involuntary is one important difference between religious credence and factual belief. Uh, another one, and I'll go a little bit quicker through these next differences, but the extent to which they're compartmentalized is importantly different. Your broad class of factual beliefs about the world, you know, where your neighborhood is, which house is yours, where to get food, how to turn on the lights, where the shower is in your house, what your friend's names are. Your model of the world, so to speak, is constantly operated, operating in guiding your behavior. However, it's pretty clear that religious quote unquote beliefs or what I call religious credences are much more compartmentalized than that. They tend to guide behavior, symbolic actions in particular, on sacred days of the week, 
sacred times, sacred places, and so on. So there's this compartmentalization in terms of how it guides and when it guides your behavior that you see much more for religious credence than factual belief. All right, uh, third difference has to do with inference. Your factual beliefs about the world and entities in the world, they guide how you think about objects and events in this highly general way, right? Even if you're imagining Paris, you still imagine Paris with the Eiffel Tower in it. Whereas we notice with religious credences, they're what I call inferentially curtailed. People don't draw inferences from them in the way you might expect if they factually believe the same contents, right? And I, I go into a lot of examples of that in the book. And then the final difference is the flip side of voluntariness. I call it evidential vulnerability. Factual beliefs are highly vulnerable to evidence. If you have decisive evidence to the contrary of one of your factual beliefs, it automatically revises. Whereas people tend to hold on to their religious credences, come what may, out of loyalty to their in-group or their religion or what have you. So on, on those four very important dimensions, we see that religious credence and factual belief work quite opposite to one another. So I think it's a mistake that a lot of philosophers and psychologists uh, tend to conflate them under the one word belief. So it's a useful general term, but to do the psychology well, you need to draw this distinction. Mm -hmm. And related to that, we hear frequently from atheists that religious people actually treat their religious beliefs as if they were factual beliefs. But uh, is there anything to that idea or not? Well, there is something to it, but it's, it's largely misguided. So um, I think partly what's going on there is, is, is with strident atheists, it's much easier to, to vilify a religious belief. Um, and I'm no great defender of religious belief myself, but I, mm -hmm. I believe in being accurate about what's going on. Yeah. Um, a lot of strident atheists like to make religious people look stupid or delusional by saying, oh, they just think that there was a talking snake, right? Or they think there's going to be 72 versions when they do the suicide bombing, or they think that there's a, a, a deity with the head of an elephant and the body of a boy, right? And if people think these things just straightforward as factual beliefs, then it seems like, well, they're crazy. And the thing that I think that is, is right to some extent is a lot of religious credences have what we might call descriptive contents. This and that happened, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But our way of relating to those contents or, or religious people's ways of relating to those contents aren't necessarily the same as factual beliefs. They're as the factual belief attitude of just straightforwardly thinking it's the case, which I explicated just a few minutes ago. It's more like an identity constituting game of make-believe, hence the title of the book, Religion as, as Make-Believe. So it's very serious in a sense. So people are very serious about their religious beliefs, but you can't really expect them to behave in most cases as if they just straightforwardly factually believe them. So that's where, that's where kind of the, the strident atheists, as I call them, uh, tend to go wrong. Mm -hmm. And referring to the title of your book, um, what is make believe exactly? Well, make-believe is something that most humans have done from a very young age. So people play pretend. Um, that's the most obvious kind of example where you can pretend to be a dinosaur as a kid or you can pretend to be police and robbers and you can pretend to be a cook. You can pretend to be lions, tigers and bears and so on. So this behavior of, of in action, portraying yourself, representing uh, things is other than how they are or other than how you factually believe them to be. It's something that developmental psychologists have studied a lot, but it's it's something that's really common to everyday experience. And I would go beyond that and say, make believe is something that people do well beyond childhood, right? In their social roles in everyday life, when they lie to people, when they're pretentious, there's 
a lot of an extension of this childhood play of make-believe into the adult realm in acting on or off the stage, in practicing, in rehearsing things. One is make-believing that one is before an audience. So make-believe is a kind of representational human action. Mm -hmm. And in the book, you talk about different features of make-believe play, like, for example, uh, a two-map cognitive structure, non-confusion, continual reality tracking. Could you tell us a little bit about that, and particularly so about the two-map cognitive structure? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, because that's one of the central elements of the book. I, in the prologue, I give the example of, of children who are playing with these superhero dolls on, on the playground, in the sand and so on. And so one of them might be named Zala. That's one of the imaginary doll names that I give. And Zala might make a booming voice from his palace, but really it's a plastic figure on top of a sand castle. And in order for the action of make-believe play to succeed, the child who's playing make-believe needs to keep track both of reality and of the make-believe world. That's the two-map cognitive structure that I talk about. Now, a lot of people lose track of this point, but it's actually crucial. If you lost track of the fact that it was a plastic doll, you wouldn't move it around for itself because the fact that it's a plastic doll means you have to move it. It doesn't move itself. But you also have to keep track of the imaginary world that you're representing as part of the make-believe play. So here's the child on the playground holding, holding a plastic doll. The child has a two-map cognitive structure. One, there's this plastic thing in my hand. Two, it has this imaginary make-believe identity that's this world of uh, um, magical and powerful super agents, which can turn into a religion if it evolves in the right way. And uh, I mean, do children or adults in any way take what they pretend to be real or not? Well, you know, it's a loaded question. Um, <laughs> the key point, I think this actually came out in the interview you did with Paul Harris, um, great developmental psychologist. Uh -huh. I rely on his work a lot. Children, from the very youngest age, they don't get confused between reality and the pretend world. They don't just start factually believing that there's actually a magical super agent in their hands or that their imaginary friend is actually capable of doing causally efficacious things in the world. So they don't get confused in that way. So in that sense, no, they don't take it to be real. They might get very absorbed in the storyline of their pretending, but keep in mind, in order for their pretending to work, they have to behave in the actual physical world that surrounds them. Mm -hmm. So they, in a sense, can't get confused about it on pain of falling into a ditch or running into the window or something like that. So um, another way of using that phrase though, and this is something maybe that I take a, a little issue with in, in the way Tanya Lerman talks about things, as much as I admire and rely on her work, is that um, you know, taking something as real can kind of be a way of talking about how it feels emotionally real to you. Okay. And I think in, in that sense, if that's what you mean by it, then absolutely, right? You can become emotionally invested and even experientially absorbed in your imaginary world. But that doesn't mean that you're confused about, um, you know, what's, what's the imaginary and what you factually believe. But I mean, when it comes to a pretend world having any sort of emotional significance, is it that people are treating it uh, really as real? I mean, perhaps this is not the best example, but for example, when we watch a movie, yeah, many times we feel emotionally invested in it. In, uh, we connect in some ways with the characters, for example, if the story is well written at least. But 
we are, I mean, at least it seems to me, I might be wrong, but we are not actually treating it as uh, real. But perhaps, I mean, this is an example that is perhaps different from uh, actual make-believe play or religious credence or something like that. No, I think, I think it's fair. My, my only point was um, the phrase, it's real for me, mm -hmm. can be used to indicate that emotional engagement. The fact that it affects me emotionally as if it were real. Mm -hmm. Okay. My point was that that way of talking doesn't imply that you're confused about reality, mm -hmm. right? Sometimes I get so into, you know, I'm a Shakespeare fan and I, you know, watch Much Ado About Nothing with Kenneth Branagh and, <laughs> and uh, um, Denzel Washington, great actors in there. Um, and, you know, it just strikes me and it's like, wow, these, these characters, you know, Claudio and, and Benedict and so on, they're real for me. And that's just kind of a loose way of saying, you know, they mean a lot to me and I'm emotionally invested and they kind of make up some part of my identity, but I'm not confused about, you know, whether Claudio is actually going to show up or Benedict is actually going to show up. I know that they're made up by Shakespeare, right? So this, again, this is why the, the you know, do people take them as real is misleading because it conflates those two different things. Okay. Confusion on the one hand mm -hmm. is emotional investment and identity on the other hand, and the one doesn't imply the other. Mm -hmm. uh, but apart from the emotional impact, uh, what are some of the other ways a pretend world can impact people psychologically? Well, the, the key thing to say is it, is it impacts what you do and it impacts a lot of times what you don't do. So I do think um, that, you know, the narratives that you lay over events can kind of give you an orientation. And, um, and I think even if you're not psychologically confused between the real world and those events, it'll affect what you desire to do. It'll affect especially who's in your in-group and out-group and what you see as justified. I'll give you a very simple example of it. And I think it, I think it illustrates my, my idea of religion as make-believe. I don't talk about this in the book, but I, uh, I lived in South Africa from 2010 to 2011. And I learned some very interesting things there. And, um, as you know, there are Afrikaners, so European heritage, white people, Dutch, you know, in the, fur, in the far background of them. And one narrative that they have about themselves is that they're like the Israelites finding the promised land. So they're ordained by God to, to go into South Africa and make it their land, and that's their promised land. So they're overlaying the Israelite narrative on their contemporary situation. Now, to my earlier point, they're not actually confused, right? They don't think they're Israelites, straightforwardly so. But the fact that they have this religious credence that they're ordained by God in the same way gives them a certain entitlement, right? It might cause them to ignore certain other facts. So insofar as uh, religious credences shape your behavior, give you a narrative or an orientation, uh, it will still affect what you bother to learn, what you ignore, and also what you want to do in, in all sorts of different ways. I, I, I can't say that I can list all the different ways because people are complex creatures. Mm -hmm. And do you think that it is important here to establish and understand a difference between thinking and believing? Well, the words think and believe are, um, uh, you know, flexible words, just like a lot of words for psychological states and processes in English and in other languages. Um, so the point that I make, this comes out in chapter five about the language of think and believe is this. 
that I think ordinary, everyday, at least neurotypical people are sort of at least intuitively aware of the distinction that I'm drawing at a theoretical level. All right. So people will say things like, oh, you can't argue with someone's beliefs. People won't change their beliefs. And when they say that, they're actually talking about religious credences. But, you know, everyone knows that if, if, if you have the wrong idea about when the supermarket closes, if you're not crazy, you can be corrected, you know, just tell them what the correct time is or tell them. So, so in that sense, everyone knows that you can change factual beliefs. So insofar as people have different norms and expectations for religious credences and factual beliefs, people you know, all around the world are implicitly aware of the distinction that I'm drawing at a theoretical level. And the think believe uh, distinction that you're asking about, it's really a matter of ordinary language showing that people use different words to track the distinction. I'll, I'll give you a, a simple example. When, when people report religious beliefs, they're much more likely to say something like, um, you know, Zane believes that Ganesh has the head of an elephant, right? Or Fred believes that Jesus died for his sins. You're, you're much less likely to say Fred thinks that Jesus died for his sins. Whereas when, at least in American English, and, and we found analogs in other languages, and this is research that I did together with Tanya Lerman and Kara Weissman, people tend to use a different attitude verb for factual beliefs. <clears throat> so for example, Fred thinks that his bicycle is in the garage, or Zane thinks that George Washington was the first US president. So the point of distinguishing thinking and believing, that's not so much a, a theoretical distinction I'm making as a, a piece of evidence for the fact that ordinary, you know, everyday lay people um, aren't confusing the religious credences with the factual beliefs because they talk about them in different ways. <clears throat> and this is kind of part of an overall argument that I make against my critics. Sometimes my critics have said, oh, regular people think of as religious of religious beliefs as factual beliefs. So they must, you know, they must be that, right? Or mm -hmm. at least you have to argue against that. <clears throat> so I'm arguing, well, no, you're the one who's misunderstanding ordinary social cognition. Because people talk about thinks that P and believes that P in ways that suggest they're drawing an attitude difference. Mm -hmm. In the book, you also talk about imagination and the relationship it might have to belief and more specifically in the context of the book to religious credence. So what are perhaps the main differences between mere imagining and religious credence? Well, just to set things up, when I talk about imagining, the word imagining can be used in different ways. So I'm not just talking about mental imagery or coming up with new ideas. I'm talking about this way of relating to ideas that involves engaging them in a fictional kind of or make-believe kind of way such that it might guide make-believe play. And the differences we saw between religious credence and factual belief if you were to trace the differences between imagining and factual belief, they'd be the same. Imagining is voluntary. Imagining is not responsive to evidence. Imagining is compartmentalized. Imagining is inferentially curtailed and so on. So that leads us to say that religious credence is a form of imagining, right? Or more technically what I call a secondary cognitive attitude, but you can just think of it as religious credence is, is one form of imagining. Mm -hmm. that, that leads to the objection, and you're kind of gesturing at this, hey, what, it doesn't seem like we're merely imagining when we have religious credence. It doesn't seem like when we engage in ritual symbolic action, it's as um, innocent and unloaded as pretend play that we did as kids. So there's got to be some difference there. And I acknowledge that. And what I say is, it's it's wrong to say that religious credence is factual belief, but it's it's more heavy duty than 
most imagining in the following senses, two senses. One, religious credences help constitute group identity. So your internal sense of what in-group you belong to, because religions very much are in-groups. And then two, imaginings, uh, sorry, religious credences activate what I call sacred values in ways that ordinary imaginings typically don't, right? So if I'm, if I'm pretending to be a dinosaur, um, then, you know, I'm not activating my sacred values. I'm not, you know, um, having an identity allegiance to the idea that I'm a dinosaur. Uh, but, you know, when I religiously creed that, say, the Shroud of Turin had Jesus' body in it, this um, constitutes part of my group identity. And it also causes me to apply my sacred values to that object, to treat it as inviolable. Uh, you mentioned uh, sacred values there. What are sacred values exactly? How do you approach them from a philosophical and psychological perspective? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very um, in, important question. And it's, it's important to see you know, exactly what's meant by sacred values. So let me see if I can give an idea of that. We all know what it means to value something in what I would call an ordinary utilitarian way. Mm -hmm. All right. So you say, hey, look, is a year's Netflix subscription really worth the cost? Right. Is it worth the cost of, um, uh, y y you know, uh, a new sports coat or whatever it would be? We can trade these things off against each other in a way that treats money as fungible and treats goods as uh, um, trade offable against each other. There's temporal discounting. So you, you look to the future and getting something in the future is not good, as good as getting it in the presence and so on. And sacred values are still ways of valuing entities in some sense, but that work very differently from ordinary utilitarian values. So things that are of sacred value, you're not supposed to trade them off against other things. All right. They're supposed to be inviolable in that sense. You're not supposed to temporarily discount them. So if um, Jerusalem becoming, uh, um, you know, Palestinian, for example, is a sacred value, and it is for a lot of people, you're going to act on that behalf no matter how far it is in the future, all right? Another thing that's true with sacred values, I would say, and this is, this is going off work of people like Scott Atran and, and Philip Tetlock, is that with sacred values, there's a certain insensitivity to the probability of success. So when you're going for a utilitarian value, the less likely an action is to succeed, the less likely you are to do it. But with sacred values, because they're so symbolic, the less likely an action is to succeed doesn't mean that you're less inclined to do it. All right. So there's various things that mark the sacred values. They're sort of outside the realm of utilitarian values. You can't trade the one off against the other. There's insensitivity to the probability of success. There's lack of temporal discounting. And then another thing that we can say about sacred values is that entities that are attached to the sacred value system, they exhibit a kind of contagion. And again, this is something Philip Tetlock points out. But if you have a sacred object like the Shroud of Turin, if something touches it, it becomes sacred itself. Or if something is, is um, defiled and it touches it, then that's very, very bad. So this idea of contact with sacred entities is an element of the sacred value system that isn't as active, right? And so there's a few other features of the sacred value system um, that I go, go into in chapter seven of the book, but that'll give you a broad sense. And I think maybe the, the best way of, of getting the broad sense of what sacred values are like is with, with this metaphor, great metaphor from Philip Tetlock where it's like inside of us, we have an intuitive economist and an, an intuitive theologian. 
And the intuitive economist, you know, weighs the monetary values of things. But the intuitive theologian regards things as sacred and doesn't haggle over the price of things. And in fact, gets outraged if you try to incentivize taboo trade-offs. Mm -hmm. So earlier, I've already mentioned uh, some ideas that atheists have, have about religious people, particularly their religious beliefs as, I mean, they assume that uh, religious people treat them as factual beliefs. But another frequent accusation that we hear is that religious people are irrational. And I mean, being irrational in this particular context might be referring to different things like, for example, their beliefs, their values, their practices, rituals, different kinds of behaviors they exhibit. Um, but is religion actually irrational? And how do you approach rationality through the framework you apply in your book? Well, I'm not going to offer a judgment on whether religious institutions are, are rational or not. But I do want to say something about the rationality of the psychological capacities of religious okay. people. Mm -hmm. And the tension that I get into, and this is in the last chapter before the epilogue of my book, I call it the puzzle of religious rationality, is the following. If you look at a lot of religious beliefs, their contents seem like the sort of thing that you were, you could only believe if you were super irrational, right? Like uh, a virgin had a baby, uh, a man rose from the dead, leprosy was cured by touching someone. There's a, a man with wings on his feet that flies around and brings people to the dead. Okay, so, so we can all, if you just describe it in, in very straightforward terms and what a lot of contents of religious beliefs are, they appear super irrational. But if you look at religious people in, in everyday life, they're as rational as anyone, and they can balance their checkbooks, use computers, learn math, learn history, learn to do jobs that are more or less sophisticated, learn to read and write music, so on and so forth. That would not be possible without substantial levels of what philosophers call epistemic rationality, or just the capacity to learn in logically coherent ways and update your beliefs on the basis of evidence. So this puzzle that, I'm, that, I, that I trot out is how can people who are by all you know, observable lights, rational people, um, subscribe to these apparently uh, crazy ideas, right? And you know, at least some of them are at least apparently crazy. And, what I argue in that chapter is, is my solution, my distinction between religious credence and factual belief is the most general solution to this puzzle. Because if you're able to relate to your religious ideas in a way that is more compartmentalized and is inferentially curtailed, it becomes reasonable to say you're taking an attitude towards the, those ideas that doesn't lead to confusion, and it doesn't lead to a sort of irrational infection of your broad fabric of factual beliefs. So, you know, con you know, strident atheists notwithstanding, while it may be the case that religious beliefs cause you to do irrational things, and, and sometimes that's the point, sometimes signaling behavior is all about being being someone who's a fanatic for the cause, mm -hmm. in terms of epistemic rationality, there's very little to think, little, little reason to think that religious people are epistemically irrational in general. Some of them are, right? Any class of people with billions of people are gonna have some crazies in there, but generally speaking, religious people are not. And what my theory does is really it shows how it's possible to have general rationality coexist with uh, adherence or religious credence in these apparently crazy ideas. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I mean, isn't it also the case that some of this craziness that we tend to associate with 
religious beliefs. I mean, is that really exclusive to religion? I mean, can't we also see it in, for example, uh, political ideology, political groups and other kinds of social institutions and groups like that? Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right about that. So I focus on religion and religious belief and religious credence because I think it's the clearest example of the kind of phenomenon I'm talking about. But really I have in the long course of things a more general thesis in mind, which is that religious credence is a species of what I call groupish belief or belief that constitutes one's group identity. And the real broader lesson is that groupish beliefs uh, involve a, a different cognitive attitude from mundane beliefs or factual beliefs. So a lot of the dynamics, you're absolutely right, a lot of the dynamics that I'm highlighting when it comes to religious beliefs translate over to political convictions as well. Um, and it's just that's not really where I started my investigations. Um, so, you know, and one wants to have a certain focus for the book. But uh, yeah, absolutely right. And I, I'm, you know, make room for that already at the beginning of the book in the first chapter of the book. Remember with this attitude content distinction. So religious credence is a way of relating to ideas, but in principle, those could be any sorts of ideas. Those could be, we could be sacralizing anything. So one might be, you know, sacralizing certain con conspiracy theories through religious credence. Mm -hmm. One might be sacralizing, um, you know, free market ideology. One might be sacralizing, uh, you know, the idea that vaccines cause autism, right? Or, or something like that. So the attitude, since we have this attitude content distinction, the attitude of religious credence can in principle be taken to a lot of things. And I think with political ideologies, that's essentially what is, is, is going on. So yeah, absolutely right. And, and my catchphrase for that point is this uh, uh, sentence, anything can be sacralized. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when it comes to the sort of thesis you develop in the book and this idea of uh, religion as make-believe, do you think that it would apply cross-culturally to every religion out there and every religious person? Or is this something that you do not know yet, you're not sure yet, or is something that you've per perhaps explored in particular religions, in weird cultures specifically? What are your ideas about that? Yeah, so I think, I think the idea has broad application, but ultimately this is a conceptual idea that requires empirical investigation to see how it applies. Now, I think, I think there is plenty of evidence that in other cultures, not just Western cultures, uh, we see something like religious credence or like what we were calling earlier, this two map cognitive structure. I'll just illustrate that with, with one example. Um, let's take the Viso tribe in Madagascar. Uh, great anthropologist, Rita Astuti has been studying them for around about 30 years, maybe more now, um, she's, she's been involved. And the Viso, um, you know, are, are, are largely pre-industrial um, and they practice what we would perhaps call ancestor worship or ancestor reverence. And one thing that she's observed is that with respect to the idea that the spirits of the ancestors are living in presence, they do have what I call a two map cognitive structure where sometimes mm -hmm. they simply regard the dead ancestors as these, you know, dead biological creatures that are decomposing in the ground and you can't talk to them, can't interact with them. Um, but in sacred or ritual settings, they'll talk to the ancestors as if they could hear. All right. And she even mentions kind of a joke where her adoptive father, so uh, the member of the Viso tribe who was kind of her adopted dad, um, ends the ceremony and says, and there's not going to be a reply. And that's his way of saying, and now we're done talking to our deceased ancestors. So 
just in that's one example of a, a non-Western culture where we see something like the two Mac cognitive structure. We see compartmentalization. We see you know inferential curtailment and everything like that. And I think um, if you look at examples in the past, you see evidence that religious beliefs are voluntary. And the argument for that is they're responsive to incentives in ways that that factual beliefs aren't. Right. I mean, if I, uh, um, you know, if I if I said, look, Ricardo, I'm, I'm going to burn you at the stake if uh, you continue to believe the Nile is in Egypt. I mean, you would want to change it all day, but you couldn't because, you know, the Nile is in Egypt. So your, your factual beliefs aren't responsive to incentives, uh, but people have a genuinely um, through incentives, either romantic incentives on the positive side or through, um, uh, uh, you know, the incentive of terror on the negative side, adopted different religions and chosen effectively different religious beliefs. And we've seen this all over the place. So there's plenty of reason to think that this construct that I develop of religious credence, it has broad applicability around the world. But I'm very hesitant to make a totalizing claim that it's everybody who's religious. I mean, it's more like a common thread that we're likely to see crop up again and again. But in any given religious community, it requires looking at the facts to see if they're best explained by my by my um, theoretical construct or not. Mm -hmm. So let me just ask you one last question then. Looking at the broader picture of the cognitive science of religion, if the framework you bring to the table in your book and in your work uh, has uh, an impact on it, on how we study and understand religion and religious phenomenon, phenomena, uh, what would you like it to be exactly? What would I like it to be? Well, gosh, this is going to maybe sound um, a little bit uh, um, too self-focused, but I, I would like to see people investigating um, in different, more particular communities whether or not there's evidence for religious credence there and for there being a distinction between uh, religious credence and factual belief and how it plays out. So that's that's one difference. So I, I would like to see active investigation, um, testing the validity of my ideas in, in different contexts. Um, second, I suppose uh, I would like to to see theoretical work among philosophers um, that puts a, a more coherent pressure test on my on my thinking and if my framework is the best way of, of cashing out this distinction so uh as i say in the epilogue I'm, I'm confident that something like religious credence exists something like sacred imaginings exists but it's hard philosophical work to really flesh out the distinction between factual belief and imagining so there's a lot more work to be done um third I think there's more work to be done that looks at this attitude of degrees of belief, where you can be more and less confident about things. And I think there's factual belief, I think there's religious credence, and I think there are degrees of belief. So I think that also has a role to play in explaining religious behavior that hasn't been developed well enough in a cognitive science framework, and I would like to see that being used more. I can list lots of other ones, but I'll, I'll, I'll settle for those three right now. Okay, great. So uh, the book is again, Religion as Make-Believe, a theory of belief, imagination and group identity. I'm leaving a link to it in the description box of the interview. And Neil, uh, just before we go apart from the book, would you like to tell people where they can find you and your work on the internet? All right. Well, I'm on this great website called Phil Papers, so Phil, P-H-I-L, P-A-P-E-R-S dot org. And 
all my papers are collected on there. If you just search under my name, Neil Van Leeuwen, and you'll find preprints of all my papers. I published in, in various journals, but if you start at Phil Papers, I think that's the easiest way to find everything that's not in the book that I've written. I've written a lot of popular blogs, uh, especially for the radio show Philosophy Talk. So philosophytalk.org, you can find some of my blogs there. Uh, and if you want to just shoot me an email and ask, um, you can reach me at nvan at gsu.edu. Great. So I'm adding that to the description of the interview. And uh, thank you so much again for taking the time to come on the show. I really loved the book and it was really fun to talk to you today. All right. Well, thanks for reading and thanks for chatting with me. Hi, guys. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing, please consider supporting the show on Patreon and PayPal. The links are in the description down below. And also please share, like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights Learning and Development Done Differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Perga Larson, Jerry Muller, Hans Frederick Sunde, Bernardo Seixas, Olaf, Alex, Adam Castle, Matthew Whittingbord, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Erika Lenny, John Connors, Philip Force Connolly, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegar, Rui Nassi, Zup, Mark Neves, Colin Holbrook, Simon Columbus, Phil Kavana, Michael Stormier, Samuel Andre, Francis Forte, Agnunes, Fergal Cousin, Hal Herzog, Nun Machado, Jonathan Leibrand, John Linares, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, João Weira, Tom Hummel, Sadus France, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Des Araújo, Romain Roach, Diego Londonio Correa, Anik Punta, Radan Rosmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pablo Stazewski, Nelek Bach, Guy Madsen, Gary G. Hallman, Simon Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Paul Tolentino, John Barbosa, Julian Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Douglas Fry, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzke, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Sunny Smith, John Wiseman, Daniel Friedman, William Buckner, Paul George Arnaud, Luke Loaki, Giorgio Stiofanus, Chris Williamson, Peter Wolosin, David Williams, Diogo Costa, Anton Erickson, Charles Moray, Alex Shaw, Amari Martinez, Coralie Chevalier, Bangalore Atheist, Larry Dilley Jr., Old Harrington, Starry, Michael Bailey, Dan Sperber, Robert Grassi, Igor N., Jeff McMahon, Jake Zul, Barnabas Radix, Mark Campbell, Thomas Dobner, Luke Neeson, Chris Story, Kimberly Johnson, Benjamin Galbert, Jessica Nowicki, Linda Brandin, Nicholas Carlson, Ismael Benzliman, George Coriatis, Valentin Steinman, Paul Crowley, Kate Von Goller, Alexander Hubbard, Liam Dunaway, B.R., Masood Ali Mohammadi, Perpendicular, Jonas Hurtner, Ursula Goodenough, Gregory Hastings and David Pinsoff. A special thanks to my producers, Isar Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Stefaniak, Tom Van Egdam, Bernard Hugni, Curtis Dixon, Benedict Mueller, Thomas Trumbull, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Giancarlo Montenegro, Alni Cortes, Nick Golden and Rosie. And to my executive producers, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Quadriano and Bogdan Canivet. Thank you for all.